And welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Bubba and the Bat Flip, episode 147, wrapping up our positional previews with the relief pitchers, closers, however you want to look at it. Um, there's, I, I just say relief pitchers now because there's so many of them. And um, we'll we'll get this wrapped up for you, then we'll come in the coming weeks before the season starts and get you re-reviewed for the upcoming season and all that kind of fun jazz and stuff because it is mid-February and pitchers and catchers have reported it is happening. You can find myself on mm. Twitter at BD Intric and my co-host is always on Twitter at Batflip Crazy. Toby, how we doing, my friend? Doing well. Uh, the only place you can come to get the, the review preview, you know, or the yep. re-review. Um, that's why people love us. Yeah, it's because we, we dig in deeper than anybody else. Like we review the preview of the preview of the review, and it, it's quite the thing. So it's, it's like a s'more. There's, le- there's layers to this stuff. There is for sure. Sometimes I forget if we're reviewing or previewing. Honestly, I just, you know, it gets mixed up a little bit. Yeah, it'll be fun, though, because it, it every year we do this, and it's like when we come back and review or the preview or whatever you want to say, we always realize, okay, something's changed, or these this or that or the other. It makes a big difference, especially, you know, like we're using DC ADP for all the previews. Maybe we switch to OC or so – there's no mains yet, but there's a bunch of OCs. There's at least 12 or 13, so we can get a fab idea of what's going on in the world. It's still different, but we have an idea in that regard. And that can change your outlook on uh, situations, I guess. And plus now Toby's got all his projections, which he didn't have on the earlier stuff. So he's got what, more locked in numbers. He's done a few. At least he's in one draft right now. He's might fine. have another one he's done fine. pretty Might have another one in, in the works pretty soon. Who knows? I'm just speculating. I have no clue. Just throwing it out there. Uh, we have Barf March 11th. That's on the books now. About a month away. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so, that'll be exciting. That's official. That's That'd official. I got to get there earlier than usual to get the donuts. Remember last time I that's was right. Like, that was that was I like, awesome. I went there and then I got the donuts. And I was a little late, but other people were late, so and no one cared because you brought donuts. They just showed up, so it worked out perfect. Um, yes, it was a it was a nice little nice little uh, you know icing on the cake, as they say, to have those donuts mm. show up and Oof. keep us going. That was a great. That was a great yeah. metaphor, a great donut me- metaphor. I have my moments. I have my moments that I try to, you know, try not to use them all at once, but we'll see how it goes. We'll, we'll, we'll be no Eno this year, so we'll have to, our little corner will be a little quieter, but we'll have to see how it goes. So it'll be fun. For sure. It'll be fun. But some new blood. So New blood. New blood. And uh, I, won't, I won't give away everything until it's tweeted out there, but we have a sneaky person that might take over the league. So I'm just going to say that out loud. She is very, very talented. So we'll have to wait and see. Oh, um, I think the, I know you're talking about, the, yeah. the new blood form. At least the trash talking will be at the next level. Let's put it that way. Um, all right, let's talk relief pitching here, and it's a f- conversation that some people love to continuously have because it's the ever changing world of closers in baseball and fantasy baseball too. And some are just sick and tired of it because it's like, yeah, you can either wait, get them on the waiver wire, or just draft them early and figure it out. Like, there's people have all their different ideas to it, but that's my point: is there's many, many different ideas to it. And you and I usually share pretty similar approaches to the relief pitching market of things. Um, but with some of your recent experiences in getting closers and saves, Toby, how do you approach saves this year, at least how are you planning on approaching saves this year as they are going early yet again for the elite closers? My recent experiences, that's such a kind way to say it. Yeah, I I look back at some of my teams and I'm like, yeah, the saves, the save, saves are an issue. Um, I think I don't know. It's a, it's such a torn thing. I think I get pulled left and right on this one, honestly, because I think there's so much to be said for getting those guys early that are like locked in, but then there's the opportunity cost piece, and it's like, you know, in like a main event or something like that, you know, where you need saves, but you know, you also need to leave with some sort of weakness, you know, like there's, there's gotta be something you don't have. I'm tempted to go later on. I think one of the challenges in the approach that I've taken recently is, is just getting one, you know? So maybe I wait a little bit and get two, not that you can wait all that long, but you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, closer to rounds, you know, seven, eight, you know, six through eight versus, you know, grabbing a guy in two and three, something like that. Um, so we'll see, you know, so I kind of go back and forth, you know, I just read, I was just reading the process and they had an inter- interesting tidbit about um, the 2022 main event. And, um, and so that was, that was definitely, it was interesting to read that. I won't tell you guys what's in there cause you got to buy the process. 
but I think that may factor into my judgment a little bit. Um, so I think I definitely want to leave the draft with two guys. Although in my one draft this year, I've, I've only got one, but it's a DC and like, whatever, man, like Back there's like, back. yeah, there's like 2000, 500 teams that are going to be in that, you know, I got to get lucky somewhere to compete in the overall. And that's really the one that, that, that matters a little bit. Um, so yeah, so I think I'm going to try to leave the drafts with two in like, you know, the first 10 rounds or something like that, like guys that are locked in, but I'm going to try to do a little evaluation, you know, like where are the guys that I like that, that I feel like can maybe take that next step. You know, the guys that, you know, last year. Yeah. So I think my, my, I may take a different tact in different drafts depending on what's in front of me. And like I mentioned before, I'm also trying to be a little bit more flexible and not go in with like a really rigid idea of how I'm going to draft and, and kind of let, let what, what happens come to me. So we'll see. And one, one of the many things, key things there that I took away is, um, and I've started to use it in my DC that I'm in now is you need to know your formats. Cause like in a DC, the number of saves you need to potentially win your league or your 80 percentile is a lot lower than in certain fab leagues because you're not fabbing saves. So you can get away with getting like the one guy instead of having to be super aggressive as much as say other formats where you need more saves to actually qualify in certain categories. And that, that makes a big difference. Also um, it's the old saying you can walk away with two and, and be comfortable or you can just work for it. And like the guilds talks about it. He goes, there's saves to be had out there. It's just a lot of work. And if you want to work at it, you can get them. But it's like, and there's a lot of failing and there's a lot of like, you're going to fail, fail, fail. And then you're going to hit this one guy that just crushes for you. That's, that's the game you have to play. If you want, if you're willing to play it, it's very doable. It's just not everybody has the time or the willingness or the patience or whatever to do it. So it, it, yet, like there's where the non-rigid drafting comes into play is if you know it's out there and it's, it's the problem I have every time I draft. Like I want at least one for sure. I try to want like two out of the first like 15 guys but there comes a point where you, you get to a certain level of relievers we'll talk about, and they all start to become the same almost, where there's a lot of similarities, a lot of either bad teams or questionable roles or just so many things where does it even make sense to take one here or does it make sense to wait to round 20 and take a spec there? And that's where it starts to get a little more interesting, and there's a lot more opportunity cost questions involved in that as well. So. It's a, it's a discussion that many people have had on many shows, and we could probably have this forever because there are a lot of different ways to go about it. But I think when we talk about the top 15 going off the board, people might get a sense of where we're leaning on this draft situation. So let's just cut to the chase here, Toby, and let's get to the number one closer. We're using uh, Draft Champions ADP over the last two weeks from January 30th to February 13th, 11 drafts in the books. And the top closer off the board is the fourth pitcher off the board at ADP of 24.27. Edwin Diaz coming off his like just insane season for the Mets last year, Toby. There's not a whole lot that you can poke holes at if you want. You could say, yeah, he's a closer. Yeah, you know, he's had bad years before and all these things. Back to back 32 safe seasons, back to back 62 innings seasons. Strikeout rate was through the roof this past year. It was 50.2%. Yeah, it was a year it's for the wild. ages. It was it's it was insane what he wild. put together with the ratios to to boot. It was just I it the, the one thing I'll say, obviously there's gonna be regression. Like you can't be that like you could, I guess, but it's very hard to be that good back to back years. That's my only thing. So do that do with that what you wish. Yeah. Your mic went out. Oh, my mic went out. Now you're back, you're back, you're back. Oh, I'm back, I'm back. My mic's in and out, my mic's in and out. Um so yeah, I mean, I think, I think, yeah, there's, there's very little to quibble with. I agree with you. You know, you have to expect regression from Diaz from last year, just because the numbers were, were out of this world. But if you look at the last, you know, three seasons and obviously one is 2020. Um, so it's a shortened season, but you know, the strikeout rate has been incredible. The walk rate has been reasonable. The swinging strike rate over that period is probably close to if not surpassing 20%, which is just a ridiculous number. He's not giving up home runs. He gave up a bunch of home runs in 2019, but really outside of that, you know, he hasn't struggled with the long ball at all. So I think there's not a lot to, to mess with. I know we have a listener question coming up, you know, Diaz is the highest rated closer that I have, um, you know, on, on the spreadsheet. Uh, he comes in at, 
Uh, and this is for DCs, I will say. This is for DCs. Um, he is ranked 16th on my on the spreadsheet. Um, definite, definite article. Uh, ADP of 22. And this is in DC. So this is the one that values saves the most. So he'll obviously fall back with different formats, but um, he's really good. And even though he's may not, you know, they may use him in a little bit of a non-closer role at times. Yeah, I mean, the difference is is 30 to 30 instead of 40 saves with just, you know, off the charts contributions. He, he could still get you 40 saves, no problem. So um, yeah, I, I think I think he's the top, the top closer and there's good reason for it. Yep, I have a number one as well. And then I have this gentleman at number two as well. And it makes sense for me. Manuel Classe came in second closer off the board, ADP of almost 30, 29.64. He's coming off 42 saves, 10 more saves than Edwin Diaz last year and 10 more innings pitched. But Diaz had a better ratio and a lot more strikeouts. It's uh, pretty crazy. That just shows you what Diaz did last year. But in the saves department, Classe got the job done and he was filthy as well. Like he was very, very good last year. Um, improved the the walk rate in a big, big way, which has kind of been a bugaboo of his in recent years, and kept the ball in the park. So I got no problem if you don't if you if you miss on Diaz and you want to go class A, I got zero qualms with that either. Yeah, I mean the major difference, like you mentioned, is strikeouts. And it's not a, a small difference necessarily, right? We're talking 30. 30 strikeouts, probably um, something like that. But class A from a ratios perspective has just been incredible. You know, two straight seasons with about 70 innings pitched, a sub one five ERA, a sub one whip, a strikeout per inning. And you, it feels like there might be a little bit of room for growth there too. Does not give up homers at all. Um, you know, the swinging strike rate is 16.6% this year, 16.8% last year. I think the one place where he's maybe a little different than your typical closer is that he doesn't get the same in zone contact. So he's not able to dominate in the zone, but at the same time, I mean, last year, this is wild, a 49.8% swinging strike rate. So like 50% of the balls that he's, you know, that, that are balls that he's throwing are getting swung at, you know, which is just a remarkable, remarkable, um, achievement. I mean, it's just, it really is incredible. So again, you know, you're not going to find many qualms with a lot of the guys that are going at the very top of this. You know, I think, I think maybe he's the one that you feel the most comfortable with because he combines it with like a 60 plus percent ground ball rate. So the, you know, he's not walking guys, he's not giving up home runs. It makes it really hard to score some runs on him sometimes, you know, yeah. you're, you're hoping to get Babbitt lucky, but the dude's never had a BABIP, you know, his career BABIP's at 248. So it just gives you a sense of why he's been so dominant from a ratio perspective. Yeah, he's been absolutely amazing. So, it's, you know, to me, it's, you know, the 1A, 1B. If you want to go 1 and 2, it's fine. But those are the two clear guys up top for me. So if you want to be aggressive, you got to be aggressive and go inside the first two rounds in a 15-teamer. But there's definitely a lot of um, really nice floor involved in those two. Now we go to Josh Hader, and this is one of the bigger um, disagreements throughout a lot of fantasy Twitter these days. ADP of 36.18. Now he picked up um, 36 saves last year, which is really, really good. Strikeouts were still just fine. Walks were a problem once again. Ratios through the roof. Home runs went up. Um, a lot of things left on base went up. He did have a massive family situation going on in between his trade from Milwaukee to San Diego. It's kind of right about the time. When things blew up, things apparently got better. He started pitching better to finish the season. He's a tough one to gauge because he's going to be the closer on a very good San Diego team. But how broken is he or is it just the off-the-field stuff that was the problem? I tried to give him a mulligan here at the same time. Like you look at Eno Harris' stuff model and, and everything, it's, it's not good. So what's your thoughts on Josh Hader? Because um, I'm still in on Josh Hader, but like I'm not forcing the hand to get Josh Hader. Yeah, I, I think he's fine. I mean, I think I think what you mentioned before about the family situation, you know, I actually haven't done that much research on it, so I'm not sure exactly what was going on. I know there was like a, I just know it wasn't a good situation. So if you look at him, you know, he struggled for a period of time. And really by that, I mean, you know, he had, he gave up six runs, three runs, three runs, six runs, three runs. And so if you start him after he gave up, you know, those, those, huge things actually no 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 no. 
scratch that. I was looking at the wrong thing. If you look at him for after he had that six run game, you know, over his last 11 innings pitched, he had 14 strikeouts. He had a 0.79 ERA. Um, you know, he was not walking guys 1.59 walks per nine. I, I, at what I'm looking at, I can't get K minus walk. And then I think when you look at the skills as well, I remember doing this when I was doing like kind of my closer research as I was approaching in drafts. If you look at his last, if you look at his last 15 games, right? You know, the end zone contact was at 71.1%. So absolutely dominant. The walk rate was down to 8.5%, which is actually below his three year average. The strikeout rate, now the strikeouts hadn't necessarily rebounded, but he was still at 30.5%, right? And then the swinging strike rate was close to 16%. So, you know, all of those numbers, while not maybe your typical Josh Hader, were incredibly good. And if you go, if you bump it down to 10 games over his last 10 games, his swinging strike rate was actually above the three year average. And his walk rate was down at 2.9%. His strikeout rate was at 37.1%. His end zone was at below 70%. So whatever was going on, it feels like he fixed it. And, you know, whether it was a personal situation and you just couldn't concentrate, whatever it was, I think he fixed it. So I'm not really worried. We really have that window in an entire career where he struggled, and there's a pretty good reason for it. And so I, I'm totally comfortable taking him. Yeah, I'm on the same page with you. That's why... I get kind of, I'm curious, like, I don't like curious the right word, but I kind of get frustrated when I hear people saying like, oh, he's not that good. He has like, I believe, and people can check, I could be wrong. I believe his wife was having massive issues with the birth of their child. And there's like some scary stuff and the hospitals and like, I'd be a mess. I wouldn't be able to go out and pitch. I don't know about you. Like, so he had a lot of off the field stuff. And like you said, you look at the numbers once the baby was home and the mom was home and they were settled in San Diego things started getting better. Shocker. Like off the field's fine. Things get better on the mound. It's, it's, they're human beings. Like it just, it's that simple to me. And, um, the way he finished makes me feel like I'd be willing to go back to, to, to drafting him again. And it, it, the funny thing is, is he was the number one reliever off the board last few years. And now he's number three. If he reverts back to that number one form, I guess you get a gift here. I know people hate hearing that kind of stuff, but if you're trying to like look at the angles of, of approaching the top part of the relievers pool, that's one way to look at it. If you, if you believe he's back to being Josh Hader, this is a good value. It, it just depends if he is, but we'll see how that goes. I know people hate the value comment, but I don't know what other words you want me to use. Uh, Jordan Romano is the fourth reliever off the board coming in an ADP of 46 right now. And he had a great year too. 36 saves. Uh, strikeout rate was down a bit from previous seasons, but still pretty darn solid. Ratios were great. Um, I think he had a hiccup at one point in time with some like dead arm or shoulder issue or something, but he came back and looked great. Only concern I have with Jordan Romano right now is there was rumblings all off season of them trading for like Liam Hendricks or another closer in there to add depth to the bullpen. They went and got it. I think they got Eric Swanson already, which adds depth to the bullpen. I like Romano still the dude. I'm not worried about that much. But they, um, they're basically preparing for more. And I still think Nate Pearson could be a back-end guy at some point in time. So I like Romano a lot. I liked him last year even more. But um, I have no problem with him. Yeah, I think Romano is the one guy. I don't know if it's the one guy, but I, I'm, I don't love it. I don't love it. I think Romano might be the one guy that I'm just kind of like not that into. That's one of these top end closers. Um, again, he was perfectly fine, but you know, um, we have the kind of injury history. Last year was like the first real complete season he 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 had. A um, little bit of tapering of skills towards the back end of the year. You know, again, nothing major. He was still really good, but he's just not. He's just not as dominant. You know, the control isn't as good. You know, he has less of a history like, you know, home runs per nine. You know, he was at half of what he had been, you know, previously um, during his career. So with a low BABIP, you know, so it just feels like 
maybe the numbers aren't as dominant. You know, he does walk a few guys. And again, like guys can have warts, but if I'm drafting this guy, you know, as like, you know, in the, in the third end of the third, early fourth round in a 15 team league, you know, I, I'm not sure I feel, I feel confident enough in him to do that. There's some guys going later on that I like more. Yeah, and that's kind of where I'm, I'm at with him right now. Last year, I was all aboard the Romano train where he was getting drafted and everything, and now I'm kind of hesitant to go after him. I don't, I don't know why, but I guess it's because some of these guys after him, like you said, I like a lot better. Like the next guy, Devin Williams, huge fan of this guy. Absolutely filthy stuff that Devin Williams brings to the table. ADP of around 49, so going a, a few picks after Jordan Romano. Once he took over the role when Hader got traded, he was still as filthy, but now he racked up 15 saves in the second half of the season. Uh, a elite ratios, closer type stuff. I have zero problem. The only thing is he does walk. He has his walk issues. I will 100% acknowledge that. But when you have a 40% K rate, you know, a couple of years ago, 53% K rate, um, the style bender is filthy when he's on. He's If he could just cut the walks back some more, it could be even better. But I, I think when you're looking at ADP wise and the guy that's got the stuff, this is one of the filthier guys out there. So I, I like Devin Williams quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I like Williams. You know, the projections don't actually like him that much, which I find interesting. Um, and it may be because of just his ability to suppress contact. Here's a, here's a stat for you. He gave up 111 batted balls last year. How many barrels did he give up? I guess I'd like to say zero, but I'll say two. He gave up one barrel last year. I was right in between. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, over the course of his career, 302 batted ball events, 11 barrels, 3.6% barrel rate. So he's not given up. I mean, the guy's not given up home runs. He gave up two home runs last year. You know, the ERAs, I mean, I, I know we don't focus on ERAs, but just the ratios are just, they're incredibly good. And I mean, the skills back it up. He's got 18% plus swinging strike rate in, you know, the last two seasons, the end zone is really nice in the low seven seventies. You know, he's getting chases on pitches inside the, uh, uh, outside the zone. We know he's got the absolutely ridiculous change up. You did mention the walk rate, but I think the key thing with the walk rate is that those home run, that home run rate is down, yep. you know, so whether he'll be able to maintain that 0.3 versus the 0.83, you know, that he had in 2021 is another question, but even that year he had a two five ERA with, um, 87 strikeouts and 54 innings with a 1.19 whip. So, um, you know, again, like the whip is a little bit more of the question mark, but he's got that role. You know, I think he can be dominant in that role. And so, um, I don't mind, I don't mind taking him here. This is actually a little higher than I have him on my spreadsheet. So maybe he's moving up a tick. I had him more in like the mid fifties, but, um, you know, I don't, I don't, yeah. He's on the move, and the guy that uh, is going right behind him, though, is Ryan Presley at 55, and this has been a draft conundrum I've had at times. If I don't go to the elite guys, I look at these two, Williams and Presley. I think Williams is the better pitcher. I'm not denying that. But when it comes to the game called saves, which we're focused on, I usually lean towards Ryan Presley, and a lot of that just comes to simple facts. Look at the teams they're on. That's all I'm going to say. Very simple, like – Houston should win another 100 games, 90 to 100 games. Brewers might win 75 to 80. That's a big difference. That's a big difference in the save department. If those are savable games, that's another thing because the Astros might just blow teams out of the water. We don't know how that goes either. But you look at Williams, who's amazing, and I like him better, but you have Presley, 26 saves, 33 saves last year, 33 saves in 48 innings last year. Uh, strikeout rate was great. Ratios were just fine. The difference between the two is pretty simple. You got, you know, Williams will have the much better strikeout upside, maybe even better ratio just because he strikes so many guys out where Presley might get the save. So I guess it comes down to your team context of what you're looking for here. But I, uh, when I'm looking at overall and I want saves, I was looking at Presley. If I want the better reliever, I'm looking at Devin Williams, if that made sense to anybody out there. But uh, how do you look at Ryan Presley, Toby? Yeah, you know, I have I've drafted one elite closer this year, and it's Ryan Presley. Oh, so um, it's a pot to go. Good. And 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 it wasn't because I was targeting him or anything like that. He was just the guy that was that there. was left over. But when I did some digging, I felt pretty good 
-hmm. about the results. Um, cause I was worried a little bit about, um, about injury, right. Cause he missed time last year. Um, but, um, so in his last 11 games after he came off of, um, after he came off the injured list, he had 78.1% in zone contact. He had a close to 50% K rate, 48.7% K rate, a 38.4% O swing, 19.5% swinging strike. He did have an elevated walk rate, but he still had a 38% K minus walk. Um, and a close to 20% swinging strike rate, um, over that period of time, finished the season healthy, pitched well in the playoffs. Um, I feel good about him as a closer here. Um, so yeah, I feel, I feel, I feel fine with him in this spot. Yep. No problem taking him at all. I also don't mind if you want to wait a pick or two and go with Rice Hill Iglesias at 56. This is a guy I've always loved uh, year after year. And, um, you know, it sucked last year. He's having a good year with Anaheim. Got traded to sit behind Kenley Jansen in Atlanta. Prior to that, had three straight 30-plus save seasons outside of 2020. Of course, 28 or more in four straight. Still got you 17 last year. Another phenomenal ratio. He only had that one hiccup in 2019 where the ratios were bad. Otherwise, they've been very, very good. Uh, he's got the walks in check in recent years. They keep going down. They kind of hovering around the five-ish, five and a half mark now. Striker rate's always over thirty percent. He's just a steady, consistent arm, and now he's on a phenomenal Braves team. Like in reality, I don't like him versus Presley is quite a conversation to me. I think you might get more strikeouts with Rysel. Um, Both teams could win a boatload of baseball games. It's it's an intriguing conversation because it feels like most just anoint Presley ahead of him, but now the ADPs are even talking their pick apart. And the more I think about it, I'd probably go Iglesias over Presley personally. I, I think I might even rank Iglesias over Devin Williams just on the uh, the team he's on situation. But um, I, I like Iglesias a lot, basically what I'm saying. So what about you, Toby? Yeah, I, I, I'm in I'm in the same boat. I actually think I like him more than the, the other two as well. You know, for some reason I had in my head that he didn't have as good of a season last season, probably because of the save totals. I had him on a team, you know, so is a little bit of a bummer um, when it came to that respect. And there was a little bit of skill regression, but I feel like once he got settled with the Braves, he finished off the season um, really well. <clears throat> you know, he's going to be the closer there. So I'm just bringing up my um, <clears throat> last 15. So last 15, he had a 33% per strikeout rate. Walk rate was down at 3.5%. So 30% K minus walk. He was at close to 20% for his swinging strike rate. Um, o swing was at 47.3%. You know, the end zone wasn't great at 83.3, but the other metrics are, you know, absolutely dominant. And so um, again, I just love the situation with the Braves. They're going to win a lot of games. He's going to be there at the end. You know, he throws a decent number of innings, you know, gets gets a decent number of Ks as well. And where he's going in the draft, I feel like it's just a really nice, nice spot where you don't have to pay up in the first three rounds. You kind of snag him in the fourth. Maybe you have your one elite hitter and you've got two starting pitchers by that time or one starting pitcher and two elite um, you know, bats at that point in time. So uh, I like Iglesias a lot and where he's going. So. Yeah, yeah. I, I might have to circle him more as a priority and not take one of the early guys and kind of look at grabbing him as my ace closer going forward somewhere along that line. Maybe push him up a few picks, but make a point to get him might be something I need to do. Uh, next up is Felix Batista, another guy I like a lot. That's why it's, the elites are the elite. There's no sugarcoating what Diaz and Classe did, but this little realm of Williams, Presley, Iglesias, Batista, pick 63, even a couple guys going after this, all very good closers. All very good. They might not have the strikeout upside of like no one's got Diaz's strikeout ability. I don't think so. Maybe Williams, maybe if things start clicking. But Felix Batista, he's been filthy. Uh, took over the role eventually, got 15 saves last year, almost 35% K rate, has one of the greatest entrances in all time in Baltimore if you're a wire fan. Um, he, he's just electric, and I, I was glad he finally got the closing duties, and he basically grabbed them and ran with them. Question is, how many games does Baltimore win next year? They are an up and coming squad, so that's great. They should win some ball games, but um, Batista kind of feels like a Devin Williams light to me. 
is the way I kind of look at him. So I have nothing, no, no problems with him. I think if you want saves totals, though, he might get a little overshadowed here. Yeah, I don't think I'm that into Bautista. Um, he was really good last year. I guess it's just the track record paying so high for a guy who has a little bit of control issues and doesn't necessarily have the record and maybe he gets traded, you know, if he does pitch well, you know, for those reasons, even looking at like last year, for instance, you know, in his last 15, and again, this is just an arbitrary number, you know, it's subjective. It's 15. I could have chosen 12. I could have chosen 20. Who knows what that would have done, but you know, it's a nice little sample of games for a relief pitcher. Over his last 15, you know, his end zone was 84.8%, so right around league average. The walk rate was at 11.3%. Swinging strike rate was at 15.2. Very good, you know, very good swinging strike rate. Not necessarily those elite levels that we've seen from some of the other guys that we've talked about, except for Romano. Um, but, you know, and still like 33.8% K rate, right? So 21% K minus walk rate. The O swing was close to 40%. So there's some good and some bad, but I, we just don't have the same track record with him. And so I feel like I'm trying to stay away from guys where, <clears throat> where maybe I feel like the, the regression to the mean might happen this year, you know, um, the regression to this, the true skill level, which doesn't mean he's necessarily bad, but maybe he's more of a three, five, four ERA guy, um, as opposed to what he is right now. And then again, like with the possibility of him getting traded, I mean, there was even talk that he might get traded last year. Just a little, I want a little bit more um, from a closer at that point. So anyways, yeah. that's that's um, what I'm sticking to. Yeah, like I loved him when I could get him off the waiver wire last year or you could get him like late in DC drafts and stuff. And now it's a little trickier, a little trickier with Mr. Felix Bautista. I kind of feel the same way about Ryan Helsley, honestly. And I, I could be wrong, but I was never really in on him last year. He got 19 saves, which was good. But it was like, is that you got 19 saves in 64 innings? Are we to saying that's good for closers now? I don't know. Just trying to like see what's going on here. Strike rate jumped tremendously from previous seasons. Uh, the ratios were great, like you'd hope for in a closer. But I'm just kind of wondering hey, is this the strikeout stuff legit from Helsley? He probably did make a big change. And I'm just curious. The walk rates dropped in a big way as well. So his whole pitch like dynamic changed. And all of a sudden he became a strikeout guy. But still, like I said, 19 saves and 54 games pitched. And I'm kind of trying to figure out, is this the guy we want at this point in the draft? So I'm, I haven't drafted him anywhere. Because plus, Giovanni Gallegos is still there. and He's very good. And I'm not saying he's taking the job anytime soon. But nothing surprises me in St. Louis. Yeah. Um um, I hell's the I'm okay on, um, you know, the reason why he took such a huge leap last year was, you know, the velocity, um, he was up one full 2.2 .2 miles per hour year over year. So he averaged 99, seven. And I think when I look at it, his rolling average graph before he also finished the season at like a, at a, at a high for his velo, his average velocity. Yeah. His average velocity over his last 15 games on his fastball was 100.7. So he was just gaining velo, gaining velo, gaining velo. Um, you know, the one thing that, uh, that I do worry about is it's just one of those like perfect seasons. And what I mean by that is, let me just, I'll, I'll give you his 15 rolling um, from last year. 75.3 uh, in zone, 39.4 O swing. 37.1 strikeout, 11.3 walk. So pretty similar, similar, uh, better than uh, Bautista, but but still, um, you know, high. And then 18.4% um, for uh, the swinging strike rate. So really dominant stuff. But what I mean by that is, you know, the dude had a 0.185 Babbitt last year you know, in a 93.4% strand rate, you know, and obviously had the one, two, five ERA. So it's like, what do you regress that to? He had a 0.74 whip, you know, so he's still going to be really good. Um, but I just, I just get nervous when like, you know, the kind of best case scenario happens. Um, and that's a little bit of what you're paying for, but I don't mind Helsley at all. The projections do like, um, Helsley. I mean, 
And by that, I just mean like they don't love any high closer that's going really high, but you know, um, Helsley they have as a six uh, plus six. So going at ADP of 63 and he's average of his rank is 57. Whereas like Bautista was, you know, uh, going at 60 and he's player 62. And then um, Romano was going at pick 45 and he's ranked 53. You know, um, Iglesias is a plus two. Devin Williams was a minus four. So it just gives you like, you know, there's not a huge difference between them. But um, I like Helsley as like among these closers, like in terms of value, I like him where he's going right now. I think the Cardinals are always a really good team, super good defensively and also really good ballpark to play in. So I think he's got a lot going in his favor. I just worry a little bit about those guys that like where they just had a perfect season because those, those don't happen often twice in a row. I guess that's the be- better way of summing up what I was kind of off of him for. I'm just like, he did all of this and it was just like out of, I guess out of nowhere is not the right way to say it, but it was just kind of like, he hasn't done this before. I'm like, here we go. Like, here we go. So uh, I'll wait and see approach for me. Uh, a guy that I do like quite a bit, and I like him every year, and his ADP keeps dropping, is Kenley Jansen, ADP of about 73, 10th reliever off the board. And what if I told you this guy has had over 30 saves for eight straight seasons outside of 2020? That's pretty good. Pretty good when it comes to the save game. A couple 40 save seasons thrown into that mix. Even when people th- say, you know, he's not the same guy, he's not. His ratios haven't been as good. That's why he's going down here compared to the elite numbers. But when we're talking the game of saves, he gets the job done, and he still gets strikeouts. At a pretty good clip. It was over 30, almost 33% again last season, 8.5% walk rate. So those are great. 1.05 whips. Out, it's still very, very good. It's just the ERA has been a little bit high as the strike, as the home runs went up last year for Kenley Jansen. But 41 more saves. The dude just keeps getting it done time and time again. 60 plus appearances year after year when people say he's getting old and breaking down. It's Boston. How good's Boston going to be this year? That's a question to have in this situation. But they signed him. He's healthy for now. The dude's going to get the ball in the ninth every time they get a chance to close out a game, and he's proven he can do it time and time again. So I've always been a Kenley guy. I've always enjoyed the fact people let him keep falling in drafts. Um, so I have nothing I have nothing opposed to Kenley Jansen outside of just not one of the ERAs, which you get from a lot of the elite closers. Yeah, um, I think you summed it up really well. I mean, there's nothing that like jumps out as being overwhelmingly good, but it's all just pretty good. Like O swing is mid mid thirties, you know, that's solid. Um, in zone contacts, 81.9% better than league average, but not as good as he's been historically. Swinging strike rate was only at 11.4%, but he still managed to strike out 32.7 and have a 24.2% K minus walk, which was the best number he's had since 2019. Um, you know, you look at his last 15 and it's, it's pretty solid too. Um, you know, so, and going to Boston, I mean, you know, Boston's not a terrible park. It's a decent enough situation. He's got a two year deal. So he's probably there throughout the course of the season. So I can definitely see it. The projections hate it. The projections hate it for sure. He's negative 39 going to ADP of 76 <laughs> and he's at, he's ranked 115. Um, so they don't like it at all, probably because of the skills, I would guess. But it's like you said, I mean, the dude performs. I mean, has he ever had he has he ever had a ERA under 371? No. Right. Has he ever had a whip under above 115? No. You know, and, and at some point in time he will. And maybe this that's this season. But you know, if you're just looking for a guy who's going later on, you don't have to spend the same draft capital on him and you're looking for saves, then maybe he's that guy. Yep, absolutely. I have zero problems with Kenley when most people are starting to get frustrated with him. It's just who he is, and he gets the job done more often than not. I'd rather take Kenley than Camilo Duvall. That's coming from a Giants fan here for a few reasons. I don't know how good the Giants are going to be this year. And Camilo's very good. Not going to knock that 27 saves last year. Can get you strikeouts. But he also walks the farm, and he is so wild at times that it could get ugly and get ugly bet, like fast. Uh, whip whip is going to be an issue from time to time with Camilo. Maybe he gets better. He's young. He can still flick a switch. I would never doubt that one bit, but he has to learn control. And he just, I haven't seen enough of it to be like overly happy with it. I, I don't mind taking him if he falls in drafts, but he's not a target when with some other guy. I guess it, it, the question is, is after Camilo, it really starts to, the cliff starts to show up and that's, that's the problem. So if you waited, you're almost stuck taking Camilo because he should get you 25 plus saves. 
like you should might get you 30 plus you never know but uh i just i get really really worried i don't want to be put in that position let's put it that way so i'd rather not draft camille at all i get it if you want to i just don't know how he's going to improve his control the way he all of last season didn't improve it at all so obviously things can change we'll see how spring training looks but as of right now i'm really worried about the uh, control issues with the ball yeah yeah i'm not really interested in Duvall at all um for the reasons you articulated i mean the control's not good the whip's not good the era has been there but there's just a lot we don't have like a long track record so is that 0.53 you know, is that, is that the home runs per nine, you know, that we're going to get, um, uh, you know, from him, uh, historically, or, you know, is, is there, is there, is it closer to, um, I don't know, is it, is it, is it higher? I just don't have that same, um, you know, faith in, in the kind of the track record K minus walk 17.5% is not great for a, relief pitcher neither is the 13.6 percent swinging strike especially for you know a guy in in these type of situations so and i also think taylor taylor rogers i mean is 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 interesting i mean i think he had a worst case scenario last year with the season that he provided um but he's a really good pitcher and i've liked him in a lot of spots and it's a really good you know hitters park it's a great spot for him i think and um and so i worry about him vulturing some saves if not outperforming Duvall and, and ending up taking a, taking that closer role. So I'm not really, I'm not interested at all. Yeah. It's a good, good point on Rogers too. Cause, um, um, good old cap Ka- Gabe Kapler would have no problem doing that at, at any point in the season. So that's a very good call as well. Uh, so there's 10 relievers in the top 86 picks going right now. The, the uh, or there's 11, sorry, 11 in the top 86. The 12th reliever off the board is at 101. So 15 picks later, we get outside the top 100 for our next potential closer. That's Clay Holmes, who had a really strong early season for the Yankees. 20 saves as a whole, uh, 254 ERA is not bad, but it got kind of rough towards the end. Velocity changed a bit, and like the final stat line was still pretty good, but the dominance was not there, and that leaves some questions heading to 2023. I still think he's the guy for now, but I would admit that it's probably not as locked in and good to go as it's been in years past. So um, just be wary. I think it's his job, but if he starts to falter, there's definitely options in New York. Yeah, for sure. Um, Yeah, I mean, he pitched really well, but it wasn't like – I mean, he'd kind of done that before, but not nearly as good as like the first half last year. You know, similar to Duvall, like he's not really dominant in the zone. He got an okay O swing, you know, 17.3% K minus walk, 12.6% swinging strike. You know, he does get a a lot of ground ball, 75% ground ball rate. That's, that's gnarly, man. That's, uh, Mm -hmm. that's, that's pretty phenomenal. Um, So, yeah, I mean, yeah, combined with the injury, I don't know. I don't know if I'm quite there on him, but um, yeah, I, I I don't know if I can. I don't know how I feel about Holmes. Yeah, I got, but he's in I've, a good situation. I mean, with the Yankees, obviously, that's the big thing. Like, and he's going to have the job if he screws up. He's going to lose, and that's kind of where we're at in this part of relievers now. They're all kind of getting to that that point, and we know how dominant he can be if he gets locked in. I guess the question is health wise because he kind of handled some issues last year. It did affect the end of his season. Uh, so we'll know more as pitchers and catchers are reporting right now. We'll kind of get an idea of how he's looking, feeling, and we can actually watch some bullpens, maybe watch him in games a little bit, which would definitely help. If he's throwing well, he might go up ADP because he is with the Yankees, and that's going to bring a lot of weight to it as well. So it's one of those, if you do kind of want to leave with two closers, I have no problem making him my closer too like, and just go on that route. But, you know, two closers on top 100 picks, that does a lot to the opportunity cost that Toby was mentioning earlier as well. So you got to kind of weigh those things out for you in that scenario. Uh, The 13th reliever off the board at ADP 103 is David Bednar. The dude we know is very, very good. There's no denying that one bit. Uh, Strikeouts are there. Everything you want there except a good team to pitch for as he pitches for Pittsburgh, who maybe wins 50 to 60 games. Um, Bednar's great, but they also use him in high leverage spots too. They'll use him for three innings some games. And it's just a – a weird way to have your dominant closer for your fantasy team. 
But um, yeah, I, I like I like Bednar a lot. I have not clicked the button though because at that ADP on the Pirates, it's very tricky for me. Plus, he could get traded, so it's just very tricky all around. Yeah, I like Bednar. Um, I think he's a really good pitcher. I mean, he's got two full seasons now of really good contributions. He's clearly the best guy in that pen. He's had a season with a reasonable strand rate and a reasonable BABIP, and he still put up a good ERA. You know, he's got two full seasons of minimizing home run damage, 25% K minus walks, 15% swinging strikes, mid 30% O swings, you know, Z contact um, around 80%. So all really good, better than a lot of the closers going ahead of him. I think the reason why people aren't, you know, are shying away, as you mentioned, is because he's playing for the Pirates and um, you know, that's totally reasonable, but I don't think there's a reason he doesn't get 25 to 30 saves as the full-time closer for that team. And if that's what he's going to be putting up, you know, I think, I think that'll be fine with the ratios that you're getting. Um, like you mentioned, like, do I want him to be my closer one? Maybe, I don't know, but, um, yeah, I just think, um, I think he's, I think he's a really good pitcher. Yeah. That's the, that's the conundrum. If you build your team, you can build around a bet, bet in our eyes, zero problem with that at all. Uh, cause, cause the talent is so good. But like I said, there's a question mark between the team, and I think he gets traded. He should have got traded last year. And that makes you wonder, like, does he get the Rysel Iglesias treatment and he goes to a team where he's not the closer now? Or does he go to a team that he, – he'd be a great closer somewhere else too. So it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. Just kind of know that going into it. That's what you're drafting for. Like, just, there, there are a couple potential conundrums in that situation. So um, just keep that in mind for sure. Now we get to our first non-official closer of the closers – in the relief pitching department is Johan Duran. He's the 14th relief pitcher off the board at 124. Depends on where you look, I should say. Some have him locked in as the closer. Some still have Jorge Lopez as the closer because um, Baldelli loves high leverage guys, and Duran is a phenomenal high leverage guy. Uh, it, at worst, it looks like Minnesota will be passing the baton from time to time in the bullpen, which makes it a little murkier. So I, at, at, at least this is our first guy that's not like the number one A in the scenario. He's sharing the role. And that makes it difficult because Duran is filthy, filthy, filthy. And that's why he could be the high leverage guy. So I have not been able to click the button for Duran. He's so talented. But when it comes to fantasy, for what we need, Toby, it's very difficult to draft him for me at least. Yeah, I mean it is it is very challenging to 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 kind of click that button, I think, depending on you know, like if you're in a if you're in a fab league or something like that. But like you mentioned, he is absolutely dominant. I mean, um, you know, over the course of the season, 89 strikeouts in 67 innings, 27.4 K minus walk, 17.9 swinging strike, O swing above 40, Z contact around 80%. Um you know, he's, he's really, really good. And I mean, Jorge Lopez has been good for like half a season, you know, and really struggled down the stretch. So, you know, I do like him the most by far in this, uh, bullpen right here. Um, whether or not, you know, with the draft capital, as you mentioned, without knowing for sure that he's got the saves, but you know, dominant guys last year, at least really tended to end up in that closer role in some point in time, including him. Um, you know, Helsley was the same where Gallego started and Helsley was just lights out, you know, kind of took the role, um, and ran with it. So, yeah, I, I would say, um, yeah, I, I think, I think he's, I think he's really good, but I do think like, maybe, maybe I feel better about getting him in a non overall, you know, like in a, in a standalone, standalone league. league. Yeah. hundred percent like that. So, yeah. I'm with you there because, like, yeah, you at least use the ratios and whatnot and make it work. And, you know, even people hate these terms, but even like in a DC format, he works great because you can you don't need as many saves and he can help you um, with all those strikeouts and ratios and stuff. So it's a little different, but yeah, he's, he's a tough one, tough one to gauge for sure. The 15th and final reliever will really focus in on the top 15 outside of some long shot uh, we will talk about is Daniel Bard, ADP 129, a guy I have not come close to drafting anywhere. He had an amazing 2022. He outperformed his skis in a tremendous way compared to previous seasons. He still is in Colorado, and I just will not be paying this price tag for a Colorado closer at any point in time of my life, and I'm not starting with Daniel Bard. So it's nothing against Daniel Bard. Great 2022 season. Do it on someone else's fantasy team, please. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, I think you're spot on. I mean, he's a closer, right? <laughs> No. Um, but the challenge being, you know, the 221 BABIP, which is, you know, super low. It's kind of the best case scenario, really low home runs per nine, really high strand rate. Um, the swinging strike rate was actually down. The O swing was actually down. The Z contact was up. And you know, so everything headed in the wrong direction. Only 18% K minus walk rate. So yeah, I, I feel the same way. I feel the same way. I'm, I yeah. would not go after him. Yeah, not the most ideal spot. So, yeah, more power to those that want to, to roll those dice. Like Those are the people that feel desperate about saves is what it comes down to. I'll just pass in that scenario and go through some later round targets, Toby. Let's do a couple picks from ADP 200 to 300. I love your picks. I uh, like them a lot, especially this first one here. So who's your first target that I'd also be targeting if we're in the same draft, say March 11th? Yeah, um, my first one, I mean, there's actually not a lot of guys in the 200 no, to 300 range. There aren't. So I felt like I was a little limited on that. Uh, but Carlos Estevez, um, I think, appears to be the closer um, in Anaheim. And, you know, he's been a fine pitcher, like outside of Coors. He's been perfectly reasonable, um, throws really hard, you know, doesn't give up. Um, well, I guess it's hard to. It's hard to say. Let's see. Let me let me check his splits here for his career. What's his home run? This is away. His road. I mean, he's he's obviously much better on the road. What I'm looking for is there we go. Yeah, 311 Woba on the road. You know, and he's a Colorado pitcher. Um, about a strike more than a strikeout per inning there. So I think he's fine. I just think he's fine. Like he's a guy who's got a role who's going pretty late. Um, I think he can put up like a perfectly perfunctory three, five ERA, you know, one, two whip, and then potentially roll into 20 to 30 saves, you know? And I think that's, that's really good. Like, I'm not going to talk like he's really great, but he's going around pick 270. So um, why not? Yeah, if you're, if you're waiting on slaves or you're trying to get a late round add to your team, zero problems at all. Um, I'm going Alex Lang, ADP at 225. He's supposed to be the closer for now for the Detroit Tigers. There's not a whole lot behind him. Like that, that, that really tickles my fancy when it comes to the Tigers. But then again, the Tigers shouldn't tickle your fancy when it comes to saves, anyways. But Lang should be the guy for now. We saw some really, really good strikeout stuff from him last year, up to over 30%. Problem is, like a lot of these later closers, they all have some warts, and his is walks over 11% walk rate last year. Um, he did was below 10% in 2021, which doesn't sound like much, but that's a good improvement for him. So if he can lower the walks a bit, that'll help with the with the whips, which is one, two, three last year was the best of his career. So there are definite concerns when it comes to Alex Lang, but also the strikeouts are great. He had a really, really strong season last year. As bad as Gregory Soto can be, we've seen him rack up saves. And at this point in the draft, you are going to have warts, like I said, if you can give me 20 to 30 saves, which Gregory Soto has done. Alex Lane can do that too. And so if you're if you're down here, he's a guy I wouldn't I, I wouldn't mind. He's not a focus of mine, but if you need a, a late guy, he's definitely on, on the board for me. Who's your yeah, next guy? Ha having yeah. a tiger tickle your fancy sounds dangerous. Very dangerous. Hopefully, uh I don't know if you're a declaw person or not, but just be very careful. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. Um, my number two guy is um, Daniel Hudson of the Dodgers. And again, I think with both of these guys, it's more just kind of like a risk reward. You know, when before Hudson got injured last year, I think he was in line to be the closer. Um, you know, when Kimbrell was de deposed from that role or when they... I don't even know if they ever deposed him from that role, but um, he was kind of the next up in line. And obviously with the injury and Evan Phillips pitching really well, Phillips is higher in the draft. So there's a lot of risk with it, but the, the Dodgers have been pretty consistent at going with one guy. And if they do give the shot to Hudson, you know, I think we underestimate how good he's been uh, now the last, uh, last couple of years, 25.8% K minus walk last year, 16.3% swinging strike. Um, 78.4% in zone contact. The O swing is a little, he's never had a great O swing, which kind of sucks, but um, he still managed to keep the walk rate um, the last couple of years relatively low. 
Um, so more just kind of like a risk reward thing. Cause if he is the closer for the Dodgers, then I think you, you're in, a, you're in pretty good shape, I would say. Yeah. I've, I've been targeting Hudson and then Phillips as well. You mentioned Evan Phillips, the guy I'll, I'll bring up here. I have no mm-hmm. problem taking both in a DC or at least getting one of the two. I think they're both going to have their moments throughout this season. Um, if I'm doing a fab league, I probably go Phillips. I think he starts the season with the job, but Hudson's going to get his for sure. And maybe Hudson starts with it. I don't know. I guess it's kind of a neck and neck deal. Both really good pitchers. Uh, Phillips ADP at 236. Uh, strikeout stuff's outstanding. 33% last year. Like you mentioned, K to walk of over 20, almost 27%. Whip at 0.76 with a 114 ERA and 64 appearances. That's pretty darn good stuff uh, from this kid. You know, 27, 28 years old. Keeps the ball in the ballpark, a 3.9% home run to fly ball, which is very good because we know the ball can fly out of uh, Dodger Stadium. So that is something that definitely takes place. A ground ball rate of almost 46%, which does help him keep the ball in the ballpark. So I like everything that involves Evan Phillips. He could be a high leverage guy and give way to Hudson at times. He could be the guy at times. I think they're both going to have their moments. So I just took Evan Phillips because Toby already took Daniel Hudson. So I took the other half of it. And basically, I would make a point. Even in fab leagues, I almost want to like stash at least one of these guys. Or if you're doing early fab drafts now, draft them both and then see how spring training goes. And you could always – to have the closer for the Dodgers is not a bad thing to have. Just throw it out there. Um, I, I think they're both going to to get run into uh, double-digit saves this year. So I put Evan Phillips. All right, post 300, who you got? All right, the first one I got is Taylor Rogers. Not to be confused with Tyler Rogers or Trevor Rogers. Well, Tyler's um, his twin brother. I know, and they're on the same team. It's yeah. quite, quite about remarkable. Freaky Friday. I know, right? Um, yeah, so I think with Rogers, um, what I like, I mean, heading into last year, we all loved Rogers, right? As the closer in San Diego, had some struggles there. Um, but you know, the numbers are still, you know, really nice. Like they're right in line with where he's been throughout his career. You know, he always has been more of a CSW guy than a swinging strike rate guy, you know, 12.3% swinging strike, but a 23.7 K minus walk, you know, the O swing was down a little bit last year, still better than league average, you know, around usual in the zone, but, um, you know, elevated BABIPs, low, uh, you know, and he normally has an elevated BABIP, but more so than usual. Uh, really low strand rate um, as well uh, for Rogers. So I just think he's a really good pitcher. And last year was kind of a worst case scenario um, in a lot of instances, knock on wood, famous last words. So, and I think that there's, there's not, I don't think Duvall's that good. And so I could definitely see them, um, you know, going to Rogers in a really good ballpark, you know, for, for pitchers, as we know, and a smart team and a team that knows how to work well with pitchers as well. So, um, I think he's a pretty similar guy to the guy he's been and, and that's a good pitcher. I wouldn't be surprised if he walks over with a handful of saves as well this year, if not taking a job, as you mentioned. So definitely on board there. I went to Oakland, which is never a good thing to do. Like you might just want to fast forward to the Toby's next guy here, but if you are desperate, Trevor May at 342 has my attention just because he's been a great closer throughout his career. I've always thought he should have gotten a chance at some point in time in Minnesota, but they actually kind of preferred him as the, the leverage setup dude. He's always had a, a strikeout rate above you know the high 20s, low 30s throughout his career. Walks have been uh, an issue from time to time. He was injured a bit last year. But the reason I bring him up, and there, there's a battle going on in Oakland between May and Acevedo and Jimenez and you know, Jackson's still back there. They got a bunch of parts, and what do they win? 40 games. So who knows what they're going to do. Um, but May, I think, in the end, gets you decent numbers, and they paid him the money, I think, to give him the shot at least out the gate. Like Oakland doesn't pay people. They paid Trevor May. It makes sense to try to pitch him and showcase him for a trade in the future. That's the Oakland A's way. So with the options back here, you can go Acevedo. He's going back here. You can pick one of these other Oakland guys if you want. I just think Trevor May has the ability and the pedigree before to potentially walk into this closer role. So that's who I had. But am I in love with it? Not a chance. But that's a guy I would have back here. Who's your next guy? This next guy I like uh, a lot, by the way. A yeah, lot. the next next guy is a longtime uh, favorite. Uh, Reynaldo Lopez of the White Sox. You know, he's had two 
Well, I'll say last year he was outstanding. 0.95 whip, 276 ERA, 63 strikeouts in 65 innings. But more importantly than that, I think he got the Ks, the walks down, which was something he struggled with um, in the rotation. He was much better as the year progressed. 14% swinging strike rate, good O swing. He was nice in the zone as well. Let's take a look at his last, like his last, however many. Um, and it's, excuse me. Bless you. It's more a, um, I think it's more a lack of trust in Graveman too. I just don't think Kendall Graveman's all that good, Agreed. you know? Um, mm-hmm. So we'll see. Actually, I mean, Lopez honestly wasn't that good towards the back end of last year. So maybe this is a foolish pick. I already drafted him in my DC. So I, I, I mean, like I was him in the spec at this point. But, well, I yeah. Great spec. Yeah. We'll see. I mean, and what I meant by that was he had like a 17% K rate in his last 15. His in zone contact was at 87. Swinging strike at 9.7. So not the best numbers, but let's just throw them out the window because we're biased. I'm with you. Let's do it. Yeah. Uh, and then the guy I'm going to go with here with my second target is Hunter Harvey. A, because Kyle Finnegan isn't that great, let's be honest. And Hunter Harvey's going at 501, which I'll take my chances with. And when you look at the situation, and, and again, Washington might not win a lot of games, so keep that in mind. But Hunter Harvey's like a former top prospect with really, really good stuff. Uh, in 38 games last year, 252 ERA for, for Washington, almost 29% carry, 21% K to walk, which is solid. 114 whip, which I'll take my chances on that one. Um, fly ball at 44%, not the most ideal situation, but 2.3% home run to fly ball. Probably some regression coming there. Going to throw that one out there as well. But I think he's got electric stuff when it comes to we've seen him when he gets put to the bullpen we've seen the velocity go up because he's not trying to start anymore we kind of wanted this with baltimore at one point in time didn't really work with injuries just getting some new life in washington at a pick of 500 to me he's the next man up in washington if finnegan goes if he gets traded if he stinks whatever carl edwards jr does not scare me if you want actual talent with it so i like hunter harvey as a spec guy to kind of stash i've pretty much stashed him everywhere so um, I'll take my chances there. He'd be a guy, at, he's 501 right now. So I'll take my chances there. Quick question for you, Bubba. Yes. Which closer from last year had the highest BABIP against with uh, runners in scoring position? Highest BABIP against with runners in scoring position. Was he a good closer or just closer? Good closer, yeah. Good closer. Um, highest BABIP against with runners in scoring position. I'd say Kenley Jansen. No, it was David Bednar at 400. Wow. Yeah. And then Devin Williams is number two at 370. Interesting. Yeah. It is One that there's like ground balls that are finding holes because they throw it so hard. You guys are just like poking at them. Yeah. I don't know. They, I'm just trying to, you know, that's one thing that I hadn't thought about as we were talking. I was like, oh, it would be interesting to look at some of these like luck metrics, you know, like Clay Holmes mm-hmm. is up there with, with 348. I wonder who's on the other end of things. It's like Pete Fairbanks, zero Babbitt. You know, it's not, it doesn't have a large sample at all, but didn't give up a single hit uh, with runners in scoring position for uh, Pete Fairbanks. Um, David Robertson, super low, 1118. And the only reason why I say this is because I was saying, like, you know, oh, it's the best case scenario or like the worst case scenario. For some of these guys, like Felix Bautista, 162 BABIP with runners in scoring position. You know, just the, those types of things that help keep the ERA lower than maybe it should be, mm-hmm. where it's not necessarily a skill thing. There, Oh, look, there's Alec Manoa at 184. <laughs> um, yeah, Daniel Hudson's up there as well. Gonsolin, Urias. You know, Dodgers are team know, BABIP, uh, though. I know. I know That's I know, been a proven know, yeah. thing. Like, the, their one, I'm really curious to see what the shift changes on how – I think they're still be just fine. I'm not saying they're going to get shelled, but I want to see the difference. Let's that number change, too, because it's going to go up a little bit at least. I'm yeah, let's, let's look at three-two counts. Oh, I'm your favorite stat. This, this is Toby's stat right here, folks. For pitching, for hitting, it's obviously home runs per barrel. Yeah, let's but, see. Uh, um, Daniel Hudson and Paul Sewell had that – Two of the four highest K minus walk rates of relievers. Sewell at 36.8, Daniel Hudson at 38.1. Uh, this is for three two counts. Um, Bednar had one of the highest at 30%. Munoz, Presley, Helsley. 
Leclerc. We didn't talk about Leclerc. I think he fit in that like no man's land where yeah. we don't cover him because he's not 200 to 300, but he's not to- top 50. He's like 150 to 200. <laughs> he's, yeah. deadly, he's one of the ones that just missed basically. Well, I get he, when I'm, I'm, t- I'm torn on him in a big way. So I, yeah, I don't know what to do there. Yeah. It's just interesting to see some of these, some of these pieces. Um, Clay and in Hall. the end, and in the end, I think we have to always mention when it comes to relievers and we look at stats and everything, the sample size is so small. So small. yeah, uh, that's what I mean. Like it, it, yeah, yeah. One, yeah, one little. Okay, so I was just like one little thing going the other direction can completely skew the entire stat line we've talked about and everything. Yeah. So. Just to give folks a, a sense, the average K minus walk rate. Oh, maybe average K minus walk. Uh, it's not showing up for some reason. Never mind. We can move on. Sorry. Just going uh, down a rabbit hole. I don't mind. These are fun rabbit holes. That's where the real interesting juices come out. But um, listener questions here. Our buddy Dave Petrosiello asks, is there any concern with Edwin Diaz that the Mets keep using him in the eighth against the meat of the lineup like they did the last two months last year? That hurt his saves the last two months. I know they upgraded his setup men, so maybe they won't. But second round in Maine is a high price to pay to put up with that. I think that's why Class A had 10 more saves. But... um, you're also getting those strikeouts and everything else with Diaz. So I think you just know it going into it personally. If you want the strikeout rate, you go for it. Yeah. I mean, it would be interesting. Let's look at the projections, what they say. Um, so, <clears throat> so the projections for Diaz have him at 34 or 35 saves. And for Class A, they have him at 35 or 36. So they have a one or two save difference. And the reason I bring that up is that they are separated by Diaz is, is ranked 16th and Class A is ranked 26th. But there's about a two and a half dollar difference there between them. Um, so what I would say is even when accounting for, you know, um, Classe having more saves, Diaz is still more valuable, I think, because of the strikeouts yep. um, that he provides. But they're close enough where, you know, if you're worried about that, then just go with Classe Pretty because much. I don't think there's a huge difference between them at all. And in some ways, Classe is a little bit safer because, you know, he gets 60 to 70% ground balls and doesn't give up homers and doesn't walk guys and, all of that stuff. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm with you 100%. Everything Toby said. A uh, little book of calm has a question. In fab and FPC formats, what are your thoughts on splitting the nine pitcher spot, seven starters, two relievers, or six and three versus other splits? Does this change between 12 and 15 teamers? And would you ever recommend these as using a reverse spot, on, a reserve spot on a relief pitcher dart? Um, I think six three works for twelves, seven twos for fifteens. It's my two cents. Could be wrong. Toby's the fifteen guy, but uh, you need more saves than a twelve. And that's just the way it works. And um, I don't mind using a reserve spot on a spec guy. Just know you need to drop him the second you realize he's not a spec guy anymore. So uh, keep that in mind. But like early drafting, like if you drafting right now or even in March, sometimes especially in twelves, all you look at my last two or three picks on spec guys that have still up for battles, and you never know what you run into, but. Just keep that in mind. Um, Toby, what do you think about this uh, breakdown for a little book of calm? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, the, in a DC, the 80th percentile goal that you're theoretically going for is 67. So if you have two very good closers that get you 35 saves each, then you're all set. But if you don't, then you're going to have to find a third guy at some points in the season. And so I think it's really just kind of like a, a fungible spot. You know, you're always looking at who gives you the best chance to be successful week in, week out. It's a week to week game. So I think having those two closers in there, you know, um, if you've got them is a great way to start out. And then you figure out how many starting pit, good starting pitches you have. And if you don't have seven that you feel comfortable throwing out, then you throw a relief pitcher in there, or you get a new closer or a closer spec and you want to toss them in there, then you do. So I don't think it's like one or the other. I think you just kind of mix it and match as the season goes on. Sometimes you'll have three. Sometimes you'll have two. Sometimes you may even have four, like towards the end of the season, if you're like me and you're trying to catch up Mm -hmm. in saves. I had one season like 
two years ago where I had eight closers in, um, you know, the last week of the season, because I was not going to, you know, I was fine and K's and everything and wins and all that jazz. So it was just a matter of the, of the saves. So you just kind of, um, I think over the course of the season, you want it to be 2.5, you know, and you're just mm-hmm. kind of depends on what, who's on your team too, though. You don't want to throw out some sh- crappy starting pitcher just because, you know, because there's a spot there. You know, we, we've learned in the past that sometimes those those bad relievers aren't worth that uh, mm-hmm. chance at a few saves. It usually it's almost like getting a bad two start pitcher. It just it kind of it just domino affects the wrong direction for you. So uh, instead of trying to improve saves, you hurt like your ratios and other columns in the process. So pick your poisons is what it comes down to. Uh, Jeff Johnson asks, "What are the Mariners going to do? Uh, Seawald or Munoz or a committee? Looks like a committee." Um, when I had Corbin Young on my Mariners preview, and I've, uh, he mentioned Suwald would be the main guy because Munoz they prefer for strikeouts, where Suwald's more like the leverage guy. But Munoz will get his too because if it's a situation where you have like the heart of the order, you just want a bunch of strikeouts, Munoz will come in. That's kind of how they did things last year. Looks to be the same this year. I, I see like maybe like a, a 60 40 Suwald, maybe 65 35. That's where I would go with it. But um, it's definitely not a one-way street. I don't know if you have a different opinion on that. Yeah. Um, I think that, yeah, I think it'll be like, it'll be divided in different ways. Um, who knows? I mean, Sewell, it's unclear whether he's going to be healthy, you know, to start That's off the season. Him. So um, I think at this point, it's just, it's all speculation. I don't mean to like avoid giving an answer, but I have no more insight into the Mariners bullpen situation and, Um, you know, I'd probably just try to go after the guy that, uh, has the lowest draft cost at this moment in time that you think might be part of that committee. Munoz is super good though, but he's also coming off injury as well. Yeah. Yeah. They're both banged up right now. So there'll there'll be an important one to watch come spring training because they're both having some issues limping into spring. Uh, Joe G's got a couple questions for us here. Is Duvall's job is it is it Duvall's job to lose in San Francisco? I'd say to start the year, yes. It's losable, but yes. Do you agree or disagree? Uh yeah, I don't I don't like Duvall. I like Rogers more. So yeah. sure. Let's do it. Um and he says Clay same question. Is it Clay Holmes' job to lose in New York? I'd say yes. Graveman's job in Chicago, yes, but we both like Ronaldo. But I'd say all those guys are for now would be penciled in as the guy, but Probably There's definitely definitely some uh, potential landmines in the yeah there. for sure. All right, Toby, that'll wrap us up. Any final thoughts on relievers as we close down our position previews? No, yeah, I mean, I think I think uh, that was fun. It thins out pretty quick. Um, That's why people so are taking them early. Be a lot of different approaches that people take to it. It'll be interesting to see what happens into drafts, right? With such a small number, like you could see in that like fifty range, you know, from like. 45 to 55 you could see like six or seven closers going right there you know and you don't want to be on the wrong end of that so it's interesting yeah it's one of those that then you have to start reaching for stuff and just totally it it can make your draft go in a bunch of different directions real quick if you uh if you had a strategy just went out the window type deal so i guess have different relief pitcher options like do you want to just say screw it we're in a fab for the year because it's doable the fact it drops off so quick shows you how many teams probably will need to be fabbed throughout the year. Um, so just keep that in mind as well. But um, that wraps up our position previews for the season. We'll be back next week starting our reviews of our previews like we do every single year, like more player debates, more you know movers and shakers and ADP, maybe more fab-based than DC-based, stuff like that to get you ready as pitchers and catchers are, are going. Uh, big time draft season's ramping up. We're like – six weeks from the start of the season it's crazy to think about we are right there uh toby will be in vegas vegas like a month doing main event drafts so it's around the corner quickly which is beautiful to say so um for toby find him on twitter at batflip crazy i'm on twitter at bdn trick this is bubba the batflip episode 147 catch you all next time